All right, welcome back to another edition of Mayday Monday. This is the October 2022 edition of the podcast. Um, hopefully you have already been uh, uh, the fire and seen the fire engineering post about this month's topic. Uh, the interview, this interview goes along with that. And um, we dive a little bit deeper into the, the topic that we talked about where we released on the first Monday of the month. Uh, before we get too far into it, uh, like we have been doing in the past, uh, I would like to acknowledge the firefighters we have lost in the line of duty since our last get together. Um, this information comes to us from the U.S. Fire Administration. Uh, we had Gerardo Rincon of the Salmon Chalice National Forest Wildfire Crew. We suffered a medical emergency while fighting the Moose Fire in Idaho. Charles D. Crampota, a captain with the Alvin Volunteer Fire Department, suffered a heart attack at home after fighting a fire earlier in the evening. <clears throat> A volunteer chief, Timothy uh, Flegger of the Keyport FD in New Jersey. Uh, he died of injuries that he suffered in a, July, in a July auto accident. In Nebraska, Chief Michael Moody of the Purdom Rural Fire Department suffered a heart attack while fighting the Bovee wildfire. And in Texas, um, a chief and a firefighter were killed in an auto collision while they were returning from an earlier uh, incident. It was Chief Curtis Brown and firefighter Brendan Torres of the Dalhart Volunteer Fire Department. Um, this month, you notice I've added names to the um, to the the line of duty desks. Um, I just I want to make sure we put a name and um, think about the person instead of it just seeing the number add up on the USFA website. So, if you would I mean, take some time, think about these members and especially their families and fire departments that are going through this uh, recovery from this tragedies. A quick review of last month's topic. You'll remember, hopefully, if you, if you looked at it, we looked at a daring rescue from Clackamas, Oregon. Uh, two firefighters, right? They, um, they ran inside. They had a fire on the first floor. They found a victim on the second floor. And using their escape equipment, right, they were able to not only um, escape the flames that were advancing on them, but they rescued the occupant. If you didn't get a chance, please go back and look at that. Also, the skill drill from last month was um, to review to review your escape equipment. Uh, get your personal escape system out, practice with it. And if you don't have a personal escape system, um, you, can, you can review um, window hang, maybe ladder slides, that kind of thing. Um, and also, if you, if you get a chance, go back and look at the podcast. We talked to a couple of subject matter experts about escape equipment. Um, I've been getting some feedback from that uh, last month's uh, interview and the uh, topic, uh, getting some um, videos, some pictures. Um, if you have that, please make sure you send them in, uh, send that stuff in. I'm going to try and find a way that we can post it, uh, maybe do some kind of a, a channel or something where we can get, I can get uh, the information that's been sent to me out to you guys so you can see it. Um, again, um, that was last month from September, this October. We want to look at um, review an incident that happened back in October of 2015. Kansas City, Missouri Fire Department suffered a, uh, a tragic incident. Two firefighters were killed in a apartment fire um, that um, we want to learn from. Uh, with us today to talk about this is Assistant Chief Jimmy Walker from um, Kansas City. Chief, will you take some time and just introduce yourself to the viewers? Absolutely. Uh, well, my name is Jimmy Walker. I am a second generation firefighter uh, here in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, my father served 20 uh, plus years uh, he, as a captain. Uh, he was killed in a building collapse in 1981 uh, while on, on duty. Uh, I joined the fire department when I was 20. been doing it for 27 years. Uh, I've worked uh, my way up from firefighter, to driver, captain, uh, battalion chief, uh, worked, uh, in the busiest districts I could in the city and, uh, saw a lot of fire activity. Uh, and it's, uh, yeah, it's been a great career. i currently, I am the assistant fire chief in charge of all emergency operations. So, uh, I have the three shift commanders underneath me and the, uh, department's, uh, chief medical officer. So, um, as this goes, right. Um, if you, if you go back and look at some of these podcasts, there's some kind of circle, like a, incestuous vine that gets us together, right? Um, I reached out again, uh, I've been, been lucky enough to have some contacts 
in the fire service. And I reached out to another fellow in Kansas, not Kansas City, not uh, Missouri, but Kansas. And he hooked me up with a couple of his friends, but brought me back to Virginia. <laughs> and then um, Chief Johnson, right, um, called you and said, hey, um, you, you've got some information with this. And you, I know you, you've done this before. So um, it, it's just it's cool how how this works. Like it definitely is is um, a small brings it brings the fire service smaller. Right. And um, that we can make these connections. And I really appreciate you giving me time on your uh, Columbus Day to come out here and talk about this. Absolutely. You know, it's uh, uh, it, it was a it was a tragic thing. But if we don't learn from uh, the tragedies that we have experiences or even the close calls, then we're doing a disservice to ourselves and our communities that we're, we swear to protect, you know. Exactly. And that's that's kind of, again, one of the missions of this that we're doing here. Um, let's talk. Let's start off here real quick. Talk about about the firefighters involved. I think a lot of times, you know, we, we again, like I mentioned earlier, it becomes a number or, you know, it's a sticker on the helmet or it's a t-shirt that we see. Um, but let's bring it back to the people involved. Uh, mm -hmm. Larry Leggio. Um, can you tell me a little bit about Larry? Uh, yeah, Larry was a, he's, he's a wild man, but he was a, he was a good firefighter. Uh, both Larry and Mesh, they, uh, they grew up in the neighborhood that we had the fire in and old Northeast and they grew up, you know, I grew up, I spent a lot of time over there as well. So, you know, our, it was, our families were, were very uh, crossed. Uh, Larry's dad worked with my dad years ago. So I, you know, after the, after Larry passed and, you know, his, his mom would talk, would come talk to me and just be like, Oh, you know, his dad loved your dad. And it was great. But uh, so Larry worked at a station, uh, I fought a lot of fire with Larry. Uh, he worked at the station just to the North of mine when I was a battalion chief. Uh, so if I had a fire on the North side, his truck company was usually uh, good chances. They were there. So I got to work with Larry quite a bit. Uh, you know, uh, good guy, liked riding his Harley. Uh, you know, I don't ride, but I have a lot of friends who do. So they were, they were on the bikes a lot. So Larry's a good guy. Uh, uh, it's, it's a sad deal. And, uh, I, uh, you know, I, I talked to Larry about five minutes before the wall collapsed and, uh, I actually talked to both of them right before. Uh, but I walked by Larry uh, and said some, something to him. I don't remember what, but yeah, it was, uh, he, he, he's, he was a big hole that, uh, on two truck that they, they had to fill. It was, it was a bad deal. So, um, Larry, um, that, uh, that day at that time, he was 43 years old, married to Missy. He didn't have any kids, but it sounds like, like, um, he became like a, a real close with nieces that, uh, he and Missy took everywhere. They went to different places. Like you said, he was a Harley rider. I am, I like to ride that. And, and um, and I can see it definitely, it definitely, um, you know, adds something else to getting guys together and becoming pretty tight. Like his father was on the job. He was on your job, his dad. Yeah. Yes. And um, he became, I guess uh, that's a promotion to become a fire apparatus operator. Uh, you know what? Uh, our job has changed. It used to be a test pr testable promotion. Now it's uh, by seniority and Larry had, the seniority uh, in order to keep advancing to the pay scales when a driver's position comes open, uh, a firefight, the firefighter seniority list dictates who, who becomes the next driver. So he, he was designated into that position. Yeah. 17 years. It's pretty good, pretty good time on there. And he said he'd uh, been in a lot of, a lot of busy, busy downtown places there. He uh, you know what, he worked in the old Northeast area uh, of Kansas city. I mean, for those familiar with Kansas city, uh, it's one of the oldest parts of town. Uh, it is, has a lot of fire activity, a uh, lot of fire activity, a lot of vacants, uh, a lot of occupied, a lot of occupied, a lot of mixed use, uh, multifamily. Uh, you know, you may be riding down, you may have a, a shotgun bungalow that sits right next to a, you know, a six story uh, wood, brick, wood frame apartment building. So uh, it's, it was a very diverse neighborhood. So when he left that, he went over to two truck, which sat in the midtown area, which again is very busy. Uh, they have a large area. So again, they can end up, you know, on the West side, where's is old Westport and the country club Plaza, which is country club Plaza is going to be really nice to the East side. That's going to have, uh, you know, more vacants, high crime, 
Uh, so yeah, he he spent a lot of time as did, you know, Mesh. Yeah, let's talk about John. John, um, he's 39 years old, married to Felicia. Sounds like he had a gang. He was raising a gang of girls there. Um, I'll start with A if you didn't see it. So, yeah, it was planned. Uh, you know what? The the Mesh family, uh, I I didn't work with John that much, and we were close to the same age. Uh, so it was, uh, you know, it was, it was uh, we grew up in the same neighborhood, went to the same school. Uh, you know, his brother was actually one of my drivers. So, you know, it's, it was unfortunate that, uh, it's a man with a good family. His, his family still, uh, he was an avid hunter and fisherman. And, uh, every year they do a clay shoot, uh, for a scholarship for him. So it's, uh, he's a very family, family oriented man. Yeah. That's what I gathered from reading and looking, following up on this. He definitely, uh, Definitely had a lot going on with his kids, wife and stuff. And it sounds like they're also kind of the both families are kind of active in, in, in helping you guys recover from this incident. Yeah. Yes. Uh, like I said, it, and I've grown close with, uh, you know, the other brother that wasn't on the fire department, uh, who is just uh, an outstanding individual who uh, Jim Mesh, I can't speak enough for, you know, he carries on the legacy of his brother. And uh, it's he he's just an awesome man who. Uh, you know, loves the fire department, won't let the memory of his brother, you know, diminish. So uh, John also worked in a busy fire station. He worked uh, in a station just on the on the edge between, it's just the east of uh, downtown Kansas City and uh, the station that uh, Larry used to work at over on the Old Northeast. So they would go from downtown to Old Northeast. So very busy, diverse area. Uh, uh, you know, it's neither man was a slacker i'll just say that yeah it, it seems um with all of these things that i've talked to a lot of people and a lot of uh you know people will say that that these were bright these were bright guys shooting stars in the fire service and um they left a hole you know that unfortunately we you know we keep we do bring in good people uh but there's definitely a void left and uh they make a mark they would have made you know really good marks is if they had stayed along. Let's any, talk yeah. about, um, go, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I'll just say, yep. It, it's it, anytime you lose anybody, it's a, it's a horrible deal. And, uh, you know, to lose two good guys, it's it makes it sting worse. Let's talk about Kansas city. So, um, I don't know much about it. I know I've, I missed out on my, my, some friends that come out there for a, they come out for an Irish festival, I guess it's like Labor Day weekend or something. It's a big Irish fest. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's pretty fun. Uh, if you like to listen to, well, I wouldn't say all Irish music, but if you like to listen to Irish music, they usually have about four stages going and uh, there's enough beer for anybody uh, that wants to consume. They can. There's plenty. I'll just say that. Uh, no, Kansas City's uh, right here in the middle of the country. Uh, the city itself is about a little over half a million people. Uh, we have a large footprint, about 318 square miles. Uh, so our city is divided in half north and south by the Missouri River. Uh, so about geographically, half of it sits north of the river, while the other half sits south, obviously. And uh, But most of our fire activity has been concentrated south of the river. Uh, it's the older part, though these days the Northland is uh, picking up. Uh, we have an international airport here in Kansas City. We have a downtown municipal airport uh, for more of the local traffic or if one of the sports teams is coming in. They'll uh, they'll fly downtown sometimes. It can it can handle a seven three seven, but uh, uh, you know it's just uh, our metropolitan area is about I think two point seven million people. So Kansas City is the largest <clears throat> municipality in our region, largest it's largest in the state of Missouri. There you go. Uh, no, it's uh, it's it's got it's very diverse as far as uh, if if whatever you want out of a firefighting career you can get if you want to work. In an area that's got, you know, two and three story balloon frame construction, you're going to get it. If you want to work in a heavy, you know, apartments, if you want to work downtown, if you want to work uh, more suburban, uh, and we even have some areas that are quite frankly rural. Uh, uh, so that's, that's Kansas City in a nutshell. we got good barbecue. And, uh, you know, if you're a football fan, you, uh, you probably know this guy named Patrick Mahomes who quarterbacks the Chiefs uh, and 
probably kind of jealous. I'm sure I'm just throwing it out there. So, uh, yes, I am. I'm very jealous. I'm a commander's fan and it's been a <laughs> old 25 years, you know? So, uh, yeah, well, we the Royals. Like, That's you guys, guys upstarts. Yeah. The Royals just, uh, you know, we got good for a couple of years there and in 2015 and I'll just say this, that, uh, as an organization, the Kansas City Royals, uh, after, uh, John and Larry, uh, passed away were a wonderful wonderful organization to uh to work with they it was during a playoff run we won the world series that year uh it was and the royals really reached out and uh comforted our our community uh firefighting community it was so a big shout out to the royals Again, not knowing much, I always thought St. Louis would be bigger, but I guess they probably were, right? And then they had a lot of a lot of blood industry and stuff move out years ago. Well, and I'm St. Louis is landlocked. They have a larger metropolitan area. Uh, they have a lot more suburbs than we do. Uh, but while I say we still have quite a bit of suburbs, it's just we have land, and that's why the city keeps growing. Uh, so yeah, your city keeps growing. You're, you're going to keep growing. We, it keeps growing. Yeah, our population increases on the regular, uh, mostly north of the river. Uh, as that's where there's a lot of uh, available land. Like I said, it's we probably have 25% of our fire department's resources are north of the river. So uh, it seems you had contracts. I, as I was reading these things, you have like contracts with different communities where you <laughs> provide fire service or yes. did, did the city annex them? So we have automatic aid agreements with a number of municipalities around us. So uh, we started dispatching for them. Uh, and if you look at the map on, well, as I'm facing the left, which shows the, the area, there's a couple little dots inside. Uh, we dispatch for Raytown, Missouri, which is to the south, right? Uh, yep. And we dispatch for Raytown. Uh, they have two fire stations within that, and we have an automatic aid agreement with them. So uh, it's seamless, uh, very similar to something like what Phoenix would do. Uh, Grandview to the far south, we have an uh, automatic aid agreement with them. Uh, and then far north and the right south of the International Airport is uh, not Glass. We don't contract. Gladstone's an odd one you're pointing at. Uh, they have their own fire department, and we have a mutual aid agreement with them that if they call us, we'll come help them. But uh, they don't. The same with North Kansas City. They are, they're their own, uh, but we have a uh, fire protection district up north uh, called the Southern Platte and it's over by Weatherby Lake. You can probably see it on the map uh, right south of the airport. They will, uh, we'll, we'll, we have an automatic aid agreement with them as well. So they dispatch for them and we, we run automatically. So there's no borders. Uh, the rest of the communities around us, we, uh, we just wait for mutual aid uh, to get called in. So it's, uh, and our department, we do have, uh, three technical rescue companies and a hazardous, hazardous materials team that uh, we uh, we uh, that are utilized as a regional asset. Gotcha. So I, again, so the whole state thing, right? I mean, it, you go, yeah. you do mutual response across the state line, or is it not usually across much? the state line? No, uh, we have in the past. Uh, Kansas City, Kansas is uh, smaller than Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, they have a fully functional fire department. They're uh, they're pretty solid, very old communities. They're, they've got some uh, determined firefighters like we do. Uh, then uh, if you go on the Johnson County, Kansas side, you would see that it's, uh, they have they have their own aid agreements with their region. So that's, uh, it's, uh, they have one central dispatching for the entire county. Uh, the population is pretty heavy out there. Like I said, that's, uh, there's a few communities out there, Overland Park, Olathe, uh, that, you know, have a couple, you know, hundred and something thousand, 200,000 close uh, populations that are that are pretty large, but uh, like I said, we typically respond on the Missouri side when it comes to uh, for suppression. Now, tech rescue and hazmat that is a complete regional response. We have uh, numerous counties in the area have Mid America Regional Council, and uh, we work with them as far as tech rescue uh, and hazmat goes. So they'll those can be called anywhere in the fifteen county region. I got you. No, I'm flying in. I'm thinking I'm flying into the airport um, next month. We're doing a class somewhere out in Kansas. So um, maybe I can stop and, and see Kansas City. But we'll give me a holler. I'll take you to lunch. It's, uh, uh, <laughs> we, you know, we're known for barbecue, but we've got great Italian. So it's all good. All right. Let's talk about the fire department. So uh, uh, the numbers I have, 940, that came from the NIOSH. 
which of course was, uh, you know, several years ago, seven mm -hmm. years ago. So are you still, is that about how many you have a thousand uniform members? It's actually a little bit more than that. Uh, as we've been hiring, uh, as we hire people, uh, our single role EMS folks. So for some history, uh, in 2010, uh, the Kansas City Fire Department merged with a local ambulance trust. Uh, we had uh, mast uh, ambulance services and uh, we merged our with them. So we, part of the uh, agreement during the merger was that we uh, take on their employees. And so, uh, so we've got, we took their employees. We had a number of single role paramedics and EMTs <clears throat> since then, as they, as they leave, mm -hmm. we were filling positions with uh, dual cross trained firefighter paramedics or firefighter EMTs. Uh, we've always, we've always had, had to mandate that we uh, since 1992, that we ha maintain our state EMT license. So uh, really what it meant is we have more uniform. I think we're sitting a little over a thousand uniform members, our fire department uh, is about 1,287, 1,300 folks. Uh, you know, when, when you consider support, uh, we do have 35 stations, including uh, uh, our ARF station. Uh, we run 33 pumpers. We call our engines pumpers, 12 trucks. Uh, as far as the EMS, it is very fluid. We have a max number of 32 ambulances we'll have on the street at any one given time. Uh, and it can be lower depending on the time of day, but uh, we always, uh, we staff our suppression units and even staff. Uh, yeah, that's, that's our department in a nutshell. Like I said, we have uh, a hazardous materials station, a hazmat station. They have, uh, and we have our three technical rescues at three different stations. Uh, da, da, da. Try to think of what else I might've missed. You said we had two airports, which one's an international airport. Uh, and uh, yeah. You guys have some industry that you'd respond to, some manufacturing stuff? Uh, yeah, we've got a lot. Uh, we run mutual aid with a Ford plant. Uh, we have lots of industry. Uh, it's I couldn't even begin. To, uh, I'll even say this. Meta is uh, building a, okay. a large data center in our city. Uh, we've got old industry. Uh, the city was, you know, besides, you know, 150 years ago, it was known as, you know, our stockyards were, you know, it was a place where livestock was brought in from the West. And uh, we had a lot of butcher uh, shops. And then as the immigrant population increased, we, you know, at the turn of the century, we had a lot of manufacturing, steel works, uh, automobile. Uh, so we have a lot of vacant, uh, not just occupied industry. We have a lot of vacant old mill, uh, old timber construction uh, in, in buildings as well. Uh, in some neighborhoods, those have been converted into uh, you know, lofts, art studios, uh, in some neighborhoods, they're dilapidated and they, uh, they wait to burn. How's that? No, understood. I, I came from a fire department. We didn't have a whole lot of industry, right? Uh, Washington DC just had, we had, um, government buildings and, and houses. So, um, it wasn't, I don't know that it was a real fire department. You know what I mean? Cause, <laughs> cause that's part of that the real city. If anything else, we were a real fire department. We didn't, we didn't have all of that that uh, industry that I think that, you know, you miss out on to be a, a full big city fire department, but okay. So you do that, you do have some single role EMTs there or, or uh, yeah, we have about 50 single role EMTs and about 50 single role paramedics uh, that are still employed by us. And uh, they will work. Uh, we have some ambulances that are on 12 hour shifts and some ambulances we call them squad companies. They're attached to a pumper company and the pumper will staff. So they're an ALS pumper. So they'll be, they, they, they assign a squad has a minimum staffing of six, two on the ambulance, four on the pumper. And you know, one of the paramedics will be on the ambulance for half the shift and one will be on the pumper and they flip flop. That's how our squads work. Uh, then we have uh, dynamic ambulances that are, are that we call them Pittman ambulances. They work a Pittman uh, schedule and they're, they work 12 hour shifts and, uh, so that's where most of our single roles are, are assigned, yeah. but we also have plenty of dual, dual cross train folks on those as well. So three shifts, what kind of shifts do you work? You work in uh... ABC 24 hour shifts, uh, except for those Pittman's, which they work 12 on 12 off, 12 on 12 off for three days. And they're off for four, however it works. The same as our communications uh, center does that as well. But other than that, uh, our suppression will work on, a, on three 24 hour shifts. Gotcha. Okay, good.
get this thing here. Let's talk about the 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 fire, uh, the the building involved, twenty six oh eight Independence Avenue. It sounds like it was a, a building known to the crews that that were on that that incident that day, right? They they go here often for for medical calls and nuisance yep. alarms. Uh, actually, we had a fire in that building uh, within the last year. Uh, medical calls quite quite plenty. Uh, you know, in the East Coast, you refer to this as a taxpayer. It had uh, businesses on the first floor on the front street side. Uh, Independence Avenue is a major thoroughfare that runs through uh, the old Northeast neighborhood, uh, heading east and west. Uh, so it is, it's a massive, it's a major thoroughfare, very busy, uh, and it has a lot of these types of buildings on it. From you can see in this picture that you've got up here, that first floor is the ground floor, but in the back, it's actually below grade. <clears throat> so it has those uh, businesses on the front side and apartments on the, on the floors above. So um, the, the tip, the main entrance for the apartments was on the, the back side of this picture. Correct. So as we had pre, as the crews had pre-planned uh, there's an alley that sat just to the East of, uh, of, uh, of this building. So it was on the D side as you're, as you're facing it right now, that uh, there's that alley right over there that, separates this building from a grocery store. Uh, it was planned that that alley uh, be the best access to get to the rear if we had a report of a fire in the apartments. So that was worked out with those, with all the responding units. And uh, the night we got the call, it it appeared we had a fire in the apartment. Uh, crews got their heavy smoke showing <clears throat> from the back. Uh, we had people hanging on balconies in the rear. Uh, so it was, uh, all hands went to work pretty quick, uh, upgraded it uh, pretty soon, not too long after uh, we got there. Uh, I, I was a field battalion chief at the time. Uh, I worked in, a, in another busy district just to the south of, of this district where this was, but I happened to be out. And uh, when this alarm came in, I knew the building. Uh, and uh, when first crews got there and reported what they had, uh, I had myself to the alarm. So I got there pretty early on. Uh, and, uh, we were, we were affecting rescues right off the bat. So it was, you, you have different kinds of alarms. Is this one went out as like a, a street alarm, if you will. And then they, they made it to a full box or something. Is that so we, we put it out as a, we call them regular alarms. Uh, so that's, we, you can go from a regular alarm to a first alarm and basically you get, uh, in a nutshell, it's, three pumpers, you get five companies with a regular alarm and a battalion chief. Uh, you can upgrade to a first and get two battalion chiefs and add an extra ladder and a pumper. Uh, and then from there, we can go to second, third, fourth alarm, so on. This came as a regular alarm, uh, was upgraded to a second alarm. Uh, so they went straight for pulling the hook on that uh, fairly, fairly soon. Uh, crews were met with heavy smoke, uh, heat conditions, having trouble locating the fire, Nothing had presented itself on the first floor uh, yet. And so uh, we couldn't, crews were, were making entry into various ports, parts of the building, as you can see how big it is, and just kept encountering heat and some fire conditions, uh, a lot of void spaces in the structure. So um, Pumper 10 was the first arriving, first due there? Yeah, and they're probably sitting about uh, uh, maybe not even a half mile from this location. And and so again, they they probably they knew the building and they they rent they went and I guess um, right though they positioned over here on the on the the Delta Alley. Yep. Um, first arriving, and then they initially went to the apartment, or did they first go into the um, the store? They went. You can access those uh, the stores from the front. So they went into the apartments. Again, thinking that's, that's where the life is. And and it was what, after dinner or something? So Yeah, it was probably, probably about 7.30, I think. I have to look. I didn't, you know, I didn't pull up uh, the, the report. It's been a while since I've talked about it. This is all just my memories of it. Uh, so, yeah, it was, it was 7.30-ish, I believe. Uh, yeah, I'll help remind and, you. I got to, it was 7.30, I think 7.27, the alarm came in. And it was uh, like 8 o'clock, you went to... Um, the collapse zone. So 730, they got there. You said they went, they went to the apartments. Um, no, uh, they couldn't find any obvious fire, right? But no, they had they lots were, of smoke. Lots of smoke. Some crews were saying they were, they were seeing some fire uh, coming, flaring up. Uh, so we thought we had fire there. 
uh, <clears throat> after we got the rescues affected in the back, I had, we had pumper 10 and pumper 23 uh, and pumper 25 moving into the apartments looking for where the fire was. Uh, I confirmed with the IC, uh, we had made entry into the, uh, the Delta uh, business in the front. It was a vacant uh, bar. Uh, and it was probably close to about uh, eight o'clock. We had crews all over. Uh, I know that I'd walked around to the front of the building because I was getting ready to take a uh, pumper crew into uh, the uh, vacant bar. And uh, I had one of the guys on the rescue, on rescue one, uh, had come out of the structure from the front. There was a stairwell that went to the upper floors uh, into the apartments. And he said, that he goes, it's really, it's getting really, really hot now. And uh, so at that time, uh, right about then, you can see where the nail salon is, which is uh, right in there. Uh, I witnessed the windows give and fire blowtorched into the street. It was, uh, it was, I think it probably shot 30 feet straight out into the street. And, uh, you know, at this point in time, we weren't getting this. We had fire. We knew we'd recognize that point. We had fire throughout the structure and I talked to the, uh, the IC and said, I think we need to probably pull everybody out at which time we did. And we got a par and, you know, uh, this is where the lessons start coming in to, to be honest with you is because, uh, I don't know about other departments. I can tell you that, uh, we, we got everybody out. We thought we were good to go. We thought we were safe. And, you know, you're talking to your friends and getting things set up and you're going defensive and it's, uh, you know, this was a lesson that a lot of us learned that night is, you know, we have to be vigilant. And I, I can say that, you know, once it was, it, it was getting hairy there when we were inside. So once we got everybody out and we we're safe, you know, everybody takes a little, a, a deep, deep breath and kind of relaxes. And, you know, uh, as instant commanders and just everybody in general, in the fire ground, uh, you can't ever let your guard down. And, uh, you know, once we got everything set up, we were, we were getting, getting things set up to fly pipe and, uh, it went on from there. So, um, yeah, it sounds like, right. Some of those, some of those indications early on that it was, that it was going to be, uh, that it was already into the structure. Right. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I don't know if you could talk about, but it, I know it was an arson fire and that's still, there's still some litigation going on with that. Actually, uh, the owner of the nail salon was convicted. So do you, what did they, did they, did, she, did they start it with gasoline and, uh, I can't remember exactly what the, what she used. I believe she used as uh, her nail products. Uh, so, yeah. It's, it's going to be tough, right? To, to Somebody wants to burn the building down and now we have to go in there and, and save people and try and figure out. So, so obviously she wanted it to, or they wanted it to, to burn. Well, and uh, it was very interesting when the ATF came in, uh, they had, I, we had a good relationship with the ATF in our, in Kansas City. So they, offered their, uh, their resources. We accepted, uh, their investigation was very interesting. Uh, very, it, it blew my mind how enlightening, uh, the fire had been burning for a long time. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the agent in charge from the ATF here basically said, you know what, you guys lost this building, but well before you ever got there, yeah. that fire was, uh, fire was throughout the structure before we ever got there. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's unfortunate when you get in a building like this and you, and you hear something like that, but uh, you know, we were behind the eight ball and we were never going to get out from behind it. Yeah. And, and, and I know you guys, you guys did, you know, pulled everybody out and, and made the rescues. I, I know you made several people uh, rescued several people that were um, trapped by, you know, by their exit, couldn't get out and smoke and stuff kept them and you rescued that. But yeah, we, made, we made quite a few ladder rescues uh, as well as just getting people out and, and getting them out and lead them down. Yeah, listening to the, or reading the reports, it definitely sounds like uh, there were those indications, right, that that it was everywhere. And you guys, you guys did made the rescues, got everybody out. And then, you know, let's get let's get the firefighters out again. I know that they talked about um, they were cutting holes, right? They were trying to cut cut holes in the floor because the fire was below them. They were, yeah, we were just having a hard time. So they were they were doing everything they could. Yeah, we were they were looking for fire, but you have to we couldn't find fire on between the upper floors. So we were finding fire in all sorts of voids. Uh, like I said, when the ATF came in, they used, uh, they could tell by when the electricity was disconnected or when the electric electrical wires burned through each apartment, how the fire spread throughout the structure was, it was amazing. And, uh, 
but to see how it had spread from the nail salon up between the first and second floor laterally and then you know horizontally across to another apartment then vertically again up uh into other floors so it, it was uh yeah we there was nothing we were we were going to do that night to save that building yeah it's hard it's hard to understand that it was balloon frame on the second and third right over top yeah. kind of a a slab almost on that first floor yeah, exactly. So there was it's like no that place. precast. It's like that new the new construction we're seeing now, like you know. But it was 1920s when they built this. Yeah, it's it's it was pretty amazing. And the direction that the uh, floor joists uh, ran was opposite of what you would think by looking at the building. Uh, so there was a lot of different. Uh, there's there's a lot of different. It's a weird little building. Uh, was it little? So it was just a weird building. Yeah, so at at twenty at like you said eight o'clock, I know uh, the report the report says you guys decided go go um, let's get an exterior establish a collapse zone, and then it was six minutes later that the the delta wall uh, came down. Uh, four firefighters were trapped in that, and uh, Larry and uh, John were were two of those firefighters. The other two firefighters, you know, obviously were transported and and uh, recovered. Uh, but Larry and John did not survive the collapse. What um, I, I know that sounds like there was a there was a, a a order for those guys to reposition a line on that delta side. So yeah, uh, and this is where, uh, in full disclosure, I'll say this is where I think the fire service really needs to sometimes just go. And I know I messed up. I made mistakes that night, and it was an unfortunate. Uh, you know, as we as we conferred, uh, when the deputy chief got on the scene, he asked for everybody, all the all the chief officers to meet him up front. And he doled out assignments. And uh, I was in charge of the Charlie side. And, uh, you know, I walked. They made their assignments. A good friend of mine was assigned the Delta side. Uh, you know, we we made our assignment. We got our assignments. And, uh, you know, uh, the building looked secure. <laughs> I always said it looked it looked stable. We there's no indications of collapse uh, at that time. We had, I mean, we had fire, so we were going to start moving stuff around. It didn't seem, we got sticks going up in the air. We're going to fly pipe. So uh, being the firefighter that you are, I went, well, the shortest uh, shortest distance from point A to point B is a straight line. And so I walked straight down the alley. Uh, talked, to, uh, talked to Larry Leggio as I walked down the alley. Uh, things looked good. Uh, Pumper 10 had their line on the Charlie side. Uh, I made contact with that crew. Uh, they were throwing water uh, into, uh, we now had fire coming out of the second floor and I even believe the third floor, back, the balconies. We could see fire back there. They were hitting fire. Uh, I said I was going to go talk to truck five because they were having some water supply issues. So I went over and face to face with them. Uh, by the time I walked back, I was uh, right near Pumperton's rig and uh, the wall collapsed. So it, it was, it was sudden. Uh, it was sudden and catastrophic how how quickly uh, conditions changed. Uh, but Pumper 10 had repositioned their line because there's a window and fire started venting out the window. And uh, they said they were trying to protect Pumper 23's rig uh, while they were going to try to get it moved. So it was just, you know, we had a collapse zone established. We weren't adhering to, we had a number of crews who weren't adhering to our collapse zone. And uh, it's, uh, it was, we didn't have as much time as we thought. Yeah, and um, I've tried to always, you know, put ourselves in the position of being there, right? I mean, hindsight, we, we said we know hindsight, but to, to look at it through their eyes, um, I could definitely, I think we've all been in that situation where, you know, we can get right here, it looks fine, um, but um, it, it, it obviously wasn't. It's a, it's the uh, normalization of deviance, right? So uh, we, we do things and we, we miss and the near misses. And that's, uh, you know, I, I've been preaching to guys since then, you know, pay attention to the near misses, uh, just cause you've gotten away with it 20 times that 21st time is going to come back to bite you. And, you know, we were, we were moving equipment, getting things done. And, uh, it was, a we, we did not know how much fire had gotten into that structure. Um, you know, and I, I say we're lucky, uh, we could have very easily lost 20 people that night. Uh, because had that happened with our crew still inside, we would have we would have lost a lot of a lot of our guys and gals. So it was a it was a bad deal. 
So um, obviously we get the NIOSH report. We also, there's also an internal report from Kansas city, which uh, does a real good job of, of, of just what you're saying. Right. And, and admitting that um, there were some really good things that happened here. Obviously we rescued people. And then, you know, in hindsight, let's learn from this. One thing that, that struck me um, and I put that in the, in the, in the post was where it talks about how um, we think we're outside we just automatically think, oh, it's safe. We're safe. And to see that uh, written, um, I and mean, that takes a lot, right? I'm sure I know you were part of that, um, but that's definitely, you know, what we have to, how we have to learn from this. Yeah, I was part of, uh, at that time, as a battalion chief in our city, we have two unions, uh, the IFF unions, uh, one for the rank of captain below and one for chief officers that are battalion chief uh, and below. So uh, I was the secretary treasurer of the chief officers union at the time. Uh, I was at the fire. I was placed as one of the members on the committee that uh, reviewed this, which, you know, looking back, it wasn't, it wasn't easy, but especially I said, me being there, uh, those, you know, making this, I, I called myself on the mistakes that I made. And that's exactly what I've preached since then is, uh, you know what, we can get away with it over and over. I was at a fire probably two months after that and uh, <clears throat> witnessed guys. We went defensive on an apartment building. Uh, you know, a neighboring department was, uh, we were in a neighboring community and uh, it was a three-story apartment. And uh, we had guys who were staying in the clap zone and, and uh, you know, one chief loses his mind and he, the chief from that community is yelling. And I just walked up to the guys and said, Hey, you know what? I saw a couple of friends, uh, get crushed by a wall a couple, you know, a few months ago. You remember that? They're like, yeah. And I said, I should really think about moving back. Right. And they're like, sorry. And, uh, you know, I think instead of yelling, I thought, I hope my message that night, uh, the way that was delivered was more like, I still want to see you guys die. Uh, it goes to cancer. I've, you know, we say it all the time, I've seen too many of my friends die from cancer and, uh, you know, we know what we need to do to, to reduce those risks and guys, it's just time to start doing it. And, uh, you know, uh, but it was uh, we 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 took a good hard look at ourselves in the mirror and said we 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 made some mistakes and uh, we continue to try to uh, reiterate the lessons learned uh, and we learned a lot of lessons uh, and some things that we do we still don't do right. I mean, I can't tell you uh, we called out blind communications. Uh, we still I still catch crews doing it and we will call and we talk to them. It's just you know no one acknowledges what you say, then no one ever knows if it was heard. Uh, so uh, yeah, we learned a lot of lessons and uh, it was, it was a bad night that night. Uh, you know, I, my, my old driver, uh, he came up to me and pulled me off the side when we were at the hospital and, you know, it was his brother that died and he just said, what happened? Tell me. And I was, I don't wish that, I don't wish that on anybody. Uh, so, uh, you know, take the lessons we learned and, and uh, just try to learn from it. Yeah, and I just want to, while we, before we move on to talk about the building issues, uh, that, that quote that, that comes from that is that the increased, the increased sense of safety on the exterior of the stru structure was a factor at this incident. This flawed safety sense allowed for the tactical decision to perform and maintain operations within the alley on the D side of the structure. Again, that, that, um, it's tough. I'm sure it was tough for the fire chief to sign off on a report that says that. But like you're saying, right, if we don't learn from these things, we'll, we're doomed to repeat them. And uh, I commend the K Kansas City Fire Department for for doing that. One thing you talked about, do you do you guys employ like a closed loop communication on on the fire ground now? We're working, we're working toward it. I mean, it's uh you know, it's the model. Hey, you, me, yeah, hey, yeah. Me, and we try to we try to stress it, try to remind people. Uh, you know, but I've been at a. I, I listen to my the fires going on in my city. If I'm not there, and you know, I'll hear somebody go, "We need a hole in the roof." That's not. That's I try to tell them. Did anybody answer you? Well, no. Okay, well, chances are it's probably not going to get a hole in the roof, uh, or you know, throw a ladder to this side or do this or that. So. Uh, you know, like anything that any department does, uh, I mean, we're working toward it, uh, we, you know, and it's, I hate to say the excuse, COVID slows everything down. So I took this role uh, uh, after the fire, uh, 
few years after the fire, I got promoted to deputy chief. And it was the first time I didn't hold a field position. I was uh, the chief fire marshal, which was a, a different deal for me. And then now, thankfully, I'm uh, two years there and I'm back in operations. Uh, but I get here and I had ideas and COVID slapped me in the face, which I think COVID slapped a bunch of people in the face. Uh, but we're working back toward getting some uh, real field training and, and not leaving everything up to our professional development bureau to train, you know, they're busy training incumbents, uh, you know, getting new people on board and, and keeping up your EMS search and all these things that, you know, we've really tried to uh, bring some more hands-on you know, uh, tactical firefighting training to our field. So uh, thankfully right now we have a high rise that was donated to us. That's uh, going to be, uh, it's going to be vacant for the next year. So they gave it, they let, they're letting me train all of our guys. So we're, it's been, it's been very, uh, very, very fortunate for us to be able to get. And as part of all of our training that we do, I focus on, we, we always bring in that, that communications aspect because, uh, you know, I was a, I was a radio operator in the Marine Corps. That's communication is the key to success in battle is what they told us in comm school. And, uh, you know, that's what's changed, you know, from my father's time to this time is, is we can communicate better and when we can communicate better, you can coordinate better. And if, if you're not doing it, then, you know, shame on us. Yeah. Yeah. One thing you talked about when we talked earlier was uh, <clears throat> the, the um, type three construction. Um, again, I was, I was uh, spent a lot of time in a city that had a lot of type three construction and you like it, right? It looks like it's good. It looks like it's um, robust. And I do, I did, right. I spent a lot of time on, you could, you could spend a lot of time on the roof and, 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 and things like that. Um, this one, uh, type three construction. One thing you, one thing you mentioned was the, I guess the fallacy or the, the sense of security with that. Uh, can you talk about that? I'm, I want to show this one thing from the NIOSH report uh, while, while you talk about type three construction. Well, I mean, think about it. I mean, for the communities that have type three like this, uh, they understand uh, how how to operate them. We have a ton of this type of construction, uh, but for those who don't and don't know, uh, it really does give you a false sense of security. You go in there, uh, we'll have holes in the floor. We're operating in interior operations with, you know, open up. You know that, that concealed spaces are open up, holes in the floor, and they're just solid buildings with, you know, uh, robust. Uh, floor joists. So, I mean, you have a hole in the floor and you can stand right next to the hole and you're good. And, you know, if you know your buildings, you're in there and, and you sometimes make uh, too aggressive of an attack and guys can be that. Uh, uh, I'm going to throw a, uh, I'm going to throw a bone to uh, Deputy Chief George Healy from FDNY. He was just in town doing some training for us and uh, love what he says. And uh, uh, one, one of the things he says, we don't want aggressive firefighters. We want determined firefighters. And uh, that's, I, I it, it changes that mindset of being reckless. And sometimes you get in these type three buildings and you can be a little bit more determined than you can in, a, in newer construction because that the, of the lightweight element for the newer construction. So uh, you, it's, there's a lot of redundancy in the build and, and, you know, it gives you that sense of, you know, you're looking at a building like, and I did it because I did it for, so I've done it for so many years. I was looking at that building and walking by going, it looks solid right now. I know what it looks like before it collapses. And well, guess what? I don't, uh, you know, I, I, I got proved to me that night that I don't know what it looks like. You know, you used to see smoke in the mortar space. You start to hear the building creak. You start to hear things starting to collapse. You know, you get, you have so much time and the way that this, this collapsed and that inside floor collapsed it blew that wall out like a bomb. It, it literally looked like a bomb going off. Uh, it wasn't your pancake fall from the top to the bottom and people have a chance to run. You think, oh, I'm going to see this. It wasn't like that. It shot straight out from the middle and just blew bricks all over that alley. And, uh, you know, I, I always say this to people is when I looked at that, I watched that wall collapse. I was maybe 15 feet, 20 feet from it. Uh, and it wasn't a matter of, oh my gosh, I hope no one got hurt. I thought, I wonder how many people just died in front of me. That's, that was my, that was my thought. And uh, it, 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 was, it was one of the most surreal experiences I've had on the department. I always say, throw this out there because we had uh, some mental health experts come in afterwards from FDNY and elsewhere. And we really, we really worked on our uh, 
the way we handle these situations. And I was very honest with people. And I said, you know, at that point in time, I'd, uh, I guess it's been seven years. I was well over 20 years in the fire department. I had the time my father had on. I never thought about my father any time, like in an operation until that night. And I went, well, this is what it was like, huh? This is what it looked like. And I heard every brick tumble. And uh, yeah, I shared that with people to let them know that, you know, you're sometimes you see some stuff that's not, uh, it's not kosher and uh, you know, uh, it's good to share it. And, but yeah, that, that, that to go back, I was kind of a little roundabout there, that type three construction is it lends itself to overconfidence. This comes to us from uh, the NIOSH report and uh, Chris Naum, who um, was, was, uh, was, um, was reached out to by NIOSH about, he's a subject matter expert on building construction. He, he wrote this in the NIOSH report and it's some things to remember, right? That these type, these kinds of buildings, there's a high probability that multiple concealed spaces from the original construction. Then to add to that, you get, you get more concealed spaces and void, void areas from multiple additions and renovations. You talked about that with your uh, mill buildings that are being redone into, into uh, lofts and things like that. And again, right, they're putting in more void spaces. Uh, firefighting operations may not totally locate this, the, the, uh, the seat of a fire, may not readily locate, excuse me. So it can be tough to find that thing. And that, that's what we saw in, in the Independence Avenue fire you had. Fire or smoke evidence from concurrent locations, meaning you might have smoke in, in multiple areas at the same time. And then fire may be traveling or seated in single or multiple concealed spaces. Again, the, the concealed space things, right? If, if it's gotten into those things, typically these fires are of room and contents and it's very easy, right? It's easy peasy. And, but when it starts to get into the void spaces, yes, you're going to see, uh, you're going to see that, that fire in these multiple locations, going to get into these voids, it's going to be tough to find. And that's what you had on Independence Avenue. Any, um, Anything, again, you let guys learn from that. Um, anything you guys do different now? Do you send, you know, more companies? Are you uh, opening up different areas now? Well, recently, right, uh, we do send more companies for uh, apartment building fires and commercial building response. We have a commercial building response. Uh, so we automatically start off by sending more, seven resources to the five and an extra battalion chief. Uh, it, I, it has helped us on a few occasions, uh, sometimes people were like, well, we're sending so many people to a fire and we say, well, you know, what's better to, better to send them home than it is to bring them, you know, call them when you need them. It worked out really well for us. Uh, we had a fire. We, we pulled 12 people out of an apartment building uh, a few months ago and having that, having those extra resources rolling early, uh, I think made a difference. Uh, you know, so it was one of my ideas. So I'd like, I really liked the idea uh, because I saw that from them, but uh, we do send more resources uh, you know, we've, we've done, we've brought in training, especially recently. We, uh, we brought in the fire, the, the UL fire dynamic stuff. That's why, that's why chief Healy was here in town, but I had attended a three-day boot camp, and, uh, you know, it was very, very interesting. So, you know, we're trying to, we're, we're bringing back the basics of firefighting to folks, uh, on our job because after two years of COVID, it's just nice to be back to being able to do those sorts of things and to see people in person doing it. Uh, you know, we, we don't believe COVID's done, but we have to learn to live with it now. So, uh, so there is that, uh, we train, like I said, we're, we're making sure that we're educating people on that, on those building construction traits. Again, it's, you're right. It's easy to be aggressive in those buildings for us. And if they do, if it does get in the concealed spaces, what do you do? You throw more bodies at it because we have that luxury and we can get, get in there and be, uh, determined and, and make some good stops most of the time. Uh, but Unfortunately, like I said, this one, this one came to bite us and, you know, afterwards spoke with a lot of people and just said, we really, you know, adherence to a collapse zone. And I will, I will say that our department, while there's always a lapse, uh, a lot of people remember this incident still clearly and, uh, and, and ensure that that collapse zone is adhered to. Uh, those are the big ones. Those are big takeaways. Yeah, one thing um, we talked about this month's skill drill is to get out, get out of the firehouse, walk your buildings, right? Get out there and get familiar with them. Um, there's nothing like getting out and, 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 you know, looking at these places from top to bottom, right? Get down to the basement, 
get in the top of these things, get wherever you can. Um, a lot of times, you know, we get some pushback from, from, from people, but I think if they understand that, that we're there for them, right, we're going to, we're going to learn more about this building, not just for us, but so that it can be, we can get in there quicker and, and rescue them. Uh, we, we get a little bit better feedback and, and, and then they'll be, seem to be more willing to let us come and look at their buildings. But this is the kind of stuff. And we're not just looking at type threes. We want to look at all of them, but identify which ones are your ones that might be more difficult than others. I've been telling, uh, and this is something that uh, an old captain that I had years ago would do. It's we take every single opportunity to look at a structure. Uh, you know, our fire department runs about 140,000 calls a year. Uh, you know, 80% of them are EMS. So I say uh, it doesn't, because 80% of our calls are EMS doesn't mean that the 20% that are fires are any less important. So while you're on that EMS call, take a chance to look at the building that you're in. Take a look at the house that you're in, the apartment building that you're in, the high rise that you're in. Take a few minutes and look around, check the smoke detectors. That's, we always, we, we, we've always done that. You just make sure, hey, and then we tell them, hey, your smoke detector battery needs to be replaced. Well, guess what? We got a battery in the rig and then we'll do that. Or you don't have smoke detectors here. I'm gonna go ahead and get, you know, call the fire marshal's office. We'll have those, you know, come out and they'll, they'll deliver them and install it for you. Um, but we take every single chance we can when you're in a house or building or whatever to take a look at that and figure out where the staircase is, figure out, Hey, in this part of the, in this part of my district, you know, I know I recognize the small window between the first and second floor is the stairwell on these, on these particular houses. Take a look at that. You know what? And identify that that's the, that's the construction trend in that area. And now when you pull up, you can go, Hey, I'm doing my 360. I take a look, I go stairs on the left when you walk in the door and it's, uh, you know, we know, yeah. So take every single opportunity, walk the district, get out, uh, you know, that familiarity with, with your first den is, is extremely important. Uh, and, you know, I had a big battalion when I was a battalion chief, a busy battalion. Uh, I worked in it for, I was assigned there as a captain in the same station. And I went back as a battalion chief spent, you know, a decade in that district. And still when we would go on calls, I would take a look around and say, okay, just, I haven't, you know, remind myself, Where's the standpipe connection? Where's this? Where's that? Uh, you know, what am I going to do? And uh, I had another good friend of mine. He's since retired. Uh, his goal was he tricked his crew into training every single day. He would drive. They'd be on the way to this grocery store. And he would just look, oh, hey, pull over here real quick. And they'd get out. They'd start walking around the building. And then they'd start talking. Well, what would you do if this? And these guys were dialed in. I mean, they knew they knew their district. They knew what they were doing. And they never realized, I mean, they probably did, probably went, that nah, <laughs> that guy got me again. But uh, no, I mean, he took that time just driving like, hey, what would you do here? Okay, well, if you had fire here, where would you go? What do you think? And, uh, you know, it, it it served him well. He had a he had a crew that was dialed in and dialed in. They didn't even know it. And, and it's going to pay dividends, right? It's going to. I mean, you're going to, if you spend enough time in the, in the district, you're going to get a fire there. You're going to get some kind of an emergency there where you're going to come out and smell like roses because you took that time, right? You took that time to, to, uh, to learn that, get that building intelligence and it will pay off. Now that's, that's this month's skill drill. And we're trying to, trying to get companies to get out, get in there, get in their buildings. Um, you know, again, and with another thing too about this stuff is, is remember that information is, is, uh, is uh, knowledge is, is power, right? So make sure you write it down. Make sure you write something down, share it with the other shifts, right? And then you get into three buildings, they get into three. Now we've got information on six or, and you get three more from the other shift. So it just keeps, it keeps compounding and you'll get this information and you'll be, before you know it, you've got, you know, a lot of buildings in your area that you know, and, and you're going to be uh, better for it. We're working on the sharing between shifts. I've looked at some different Everything's so expensive and like every fire department, money just doesn't grow on trees. Uh, I'd like to get a nice pre-planned software so we can plug things in like that to, to houses. And, you know, you can see where you're going and if somebody's taking a look at that, uh, or, you know, but it, it's not a perfect world yet. So we just encourage people to, hey, write this stuff down, share it, uh, get out and get out and take your guys out. You know, you can push away from the TV for, you know, an hour a day to work on, you know, your tactics and you know your strategies on how you're gonna how you're gonna yeah. attack these fires and like you said you, you can't wait for for the training academy right you can't wait for the training center to do that 
they're busy doing everything else. So uh, the, the best things are the company driven grassroots efforts to come through the company and get to the firehouse. That's going to pay. That's going to be even more important when they're when they're not getting out there. And also, you're going to you're going to meet your neighbors. Right. And they're going to be they're going to be uh, a little bit more uh, a little bit more um easier to get along with and now they'll know you and then if there's ever a problem they'll be like that's not the fire department that i know so i think it, it's gonna get recruiting gonna we've always said recruiting you know you're out there if you're the face you know every fire department right now is that i've talked to is having trouble hiring enough people you're know, getting a good group of people uh, when i applied for this job you know at 27 years ago it was thousands of people for a handful of positions uh, I got hired in the first class on my hiring list. That was 15 people. And the next class was shortly thereafter of like 30. Uh, but we had thousands of people applying. Now we're getting hundreds and we're hundreds short staffed right now. So it's, I mean, I think we're sitting at around 130 positions that are open right now. So if anybody's a paramedic out there, I'm just going to go ahead and throw this out there. Uh, we love, we'll take you as a paramedic, uh, competitive salary. Uh, if you're not, move to Kansas City, and then we can uh, apply. <laughs> this one, you're going to steal people from my department too. I'm sorry, I got, I got to do it. <laughs> I got you. I got you. No, that was my payment, right, to have you come on the podcast. Exactly. I told you. I said I got, I got to throw a recruiting dig in there. I'll buy you lunch <laughs> when you come in town. How's that? All right. So, real quick, uh, usually, like, and maybe you've already covered it, but two or three things that you think the listeners would would benefit, or you want them to learn from the th what you experienced and what your department experienced? Uh, that's a good one. Don't be arrogant. Uh, you know, you, that, respect the collapse zone. Uh, you, don't, you don't know as much as you think you do. And we've gotten away with a lot of things in the past uh, because it worked at the time. So uh, yeah, I don't want anybody to have to have to see and do what we did uh, here with that situation. Uh, I yeah, respect that collapse zone. Uh, you know, that's the biggest takeaway from this is just operating arrogantly in a place that we knew we shouldn't be in thinking we still had time. Uh, <clears throat> I briefly touched on it, you know, uh, mental health. Uh, we saw after anything, after tragedy, it didn't have to be a tragedy of this magnitude. Uh, we started focusing on mental health. Uh, our union has a look for you too, has a great program with an in-house clinician, uh, which is good because we don't tell people, Everybody has PTSD. Well, that's not what that's not what this is about. It is sometimes your cup gets kind of full, and all you gotta do is learn how to knock the knock it down a few notches. Uh, <clears throat> we got guys operating out of eleven out of ten all the time, and they're losing their temper uh, because you know what? Uh, it, it it takes a toll on you. You gotta have that support system to be able to talk, and that was something that, that was a positive that came out of this that we really built that we had some these guys were very well respected and loved. And so it, it hurt, it hurt some folks. And uh, to just to having that opportunity to be able to, to talk uh, not too long from after this happened, uh, a member from Larry station and shift committed suicide. Uh, so, you know, not everybody's as strong as they think they, that they come off to. And so it's nice to have this a system in place for people to be able to reach out. Uh, you know, we say it's not a sign of weakness. It's uh, just, you know, you know, our, our forefathers, you know, they, they picked up a bottle to cope. So mental health is a big one that came out of this, but uh, as far as from the, uh, from the fire itself uh, is, you know, it's he do a collapse zone, uh, do what you got to do uh, to make your rescues and get out of there. And uh, yeah, be careful out there know your construction, know what, know what's out there, pre-plan these buildings. These companies have pre-planned the building, which I, I will say that that, because they had been there and they knew they'd been fires pre-planning that fire saved lives that night. I know, I know for a fact it did because our crews knew where to go, knew where to go, knew what to do, got in quick, protected egress, picking people out of windows because they knew what to do and how to do it and understood the building. Uh, so while some bad came out of it, uh, we know some good came out of it too. Like we said in the report. No, good. Um, if you're looking for the report, Fire Engineering has got it linked on our pod, on our, uh, on the, um, the uh, May Day Monday that came out the first Monday of the month. I'm sure it'll be linked to the, uh, to the announcement for this podcast. But uh, the internal report, uh, again, you can find it there. The NIOSH report, of course, you can find it on 
uh, NIOSH's website. Um, that's that's good stuff. Um, I, I can't, again, thank you enough for coming on um, and talking about this. Um, I, I do think, you know, sometimes we, 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 we forget the people involved. You gave us some really good info on Larry and, and, uh, and mesh there that those guys are, are, are we're, we're good firefighters. And, and I know that Kansas city um, has missing them, but uh, has got some other guys coming up that can fill those voids. Um, thank you chief for, for coming out on, on your Columbus day holiday and uh, getting interviewed. Um, I will um, call chief Johnson and tell him that um, it was good, really good uh, to meet you. Um, anything else you want to add? No, if anybody, uh, if anybody has any questions, they can feel free to reach out to me directly. I'll talk to anybody about this, uh, this stuff, whether it be the, the building itself or, or whatnot. So they can more than, more than glad to, to speak with anybody. Uh, like I said, I'll be in Ottawa, Kansas. Oh, that's uh that's a, that's a little bit of a drive. Uh, so um, next, next month. And I'll, I'll, I'll call you before I, uh, with my, when I, when I'm with my travel plans, but yeah. Thank you so I'll much. Mean, I'll take you to lunch on your way in or out. doesn't matter. All right. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, thank you all for tuning into this Mayday Monday. Uh, real quick, I'm starting to like do a better job of planning for the next ones. So the November Mayday Monday, we're going to go back to Texas and talk to some survivors of a Mayday incident and uh, learn what, what they have to, uh, to offer to us about their, their Mayday and their lessons learned. So thank you for coming. We'll see you next month.